watchmaking road trip and we are sadly approaching the end of our adventure. But to mark this, well, we had to finish the trip with a nice little firework, something special for you guys, as today we are going to visit the Bugatti like a watchmaking Grubel Force. And I think our gang was also pretty excited with the news. So guys, last visit of this trip. Pretty nice one. Okay. We're going to Grubel Force. Oh! <laughs> Please hop on. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Today, uh, today we are here at uh, I always forgot the name is Go Grobel Force. Sorry. As a brand, this watchmaking company is rather young and was launched in 2004. But despite this, it has already established itself at the pinnacle of ultra fine watchmaking. And I know I may sound a little bit carried away with this, but what they've achieved and how they've done it is simply remarkable and is the result of the vision of two men, Mr. Robert Grobel and Mr. Stephen Forsey. To make it very short, Grubel Force has approximately 100 employees and 100 timepieces per year only. And the prices of these watches is kind of way up there, but when you understand what's behind them, well then you can relativize a little bit. So this price dimension is not really what is interesting for us, but the passion and the utmost commitment to the highest level of quality really sets Grubel Force apart. And when I say quality, I'm talking both on the chronometry dimension of their timepieces to the finishing of these watches. Again, and to come back on something mentioned in a previous episode, you may like or not the design of these watches, this is quite subjective and it's fine, but when it comes to objective parameters, well, there is simply no compromise on that side. So let's meet Mr. Stephen Forsey and his legendary suspenders who greeted us and came back on their short but rich history. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much. Great thank to have you, you with for, us. Thank you for having us. Pleasure. Tell us a bit how you pulled this amazing place together. Thank you. So um, the story of Grobel Forsey is, uh, is one about people. It's about watchmaking, passion, tradition, culture, creation, and uh, really a creative spirit to, to push further. Robert and I met in Lullock, very close by, working in another company. But by the end of the 90s, we realized that um, for the year 2000 and with a new millennium, were we constrained to just work with a, an existing palette of uh, mechanism and so forth? Or could we perhaps imagine to explore some new area technically to uh, try to uh, preserve and safeguard and continue tradition of fine watchmaking in terms of hand finishing, decoration, and perhaps explore new architecture of the movement, find our own style. It was now time for us to go through their entire facility, which is encased in a very original and spectacular building, and as you can imagine, a very eco-friendly one. And actually, this building reflects very well who they are. There is a clear bridge between the past with this old farm and the present, and almost all the walls are made out of glass, because the notion of transparency and therefore the sharing of knowledge is something very dear to the brand. I'm Lionel. Uh, chef d'atelier, uh, in charge of uh, the whole teams who are working here. So we started the tour with the visit of the machining department, and yes, it's not because we're talking super high-end watchmaking that very complex machines should not be used. On the contrary, these machines enable Grubel Force to realize very fine components necessary to fulfill the technical creativeness of this team. But as you can expect, any of these components would then be hand finished in another department, and we'll get to this in a second. J'ai une question. Are you sure? Est-ce que la bague sure. elle est achetée ou elle est CNC ici? Non, achetée. <laughs> <laughs> All our guys were extremely interested with all these machines and it obviously raised quite some question. But the team of Grubel Force was just super transparent on how everything works and we could really feel that they were sincerely more than happy to share some of their knowledge with us. Oh, it's beautiful. It gets drilled and then it gets thrown by oil and then it sinks in the bottom and then the excess oil goes out. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. So, that's the technical drawing and that is the actual size of the finished product. So once the components are made, and before they are being assembled, they go through the finishing department of the brand and imagine this. 
all, and I mean every single component of every single timepiece is hand finished in this department. We actually are applying decoration on each surface, on each component produced, especially and also the one you don't see and won't ever see. Normally you do something beautiful or you do it accurate, but here we are do, going to do it both. So when you know that there are several hundred components in a global force, you can easily imagine the time it takes. And we are talking on average between 450 and 500 hours for the completion of just one watch. That's roughly between three and four months of work just for one timepiece, and that's the reason why this department is one of the most important in terms of size for the company. This tiny piece is going to take forever. It's quite, it's quite challenging. But it's also why it's very nice when it's finished. Again, our guys had a go at it, and again with very mixed results. Mm. But they clearly got what it takes and what is achieved by hand finishing. Something that will never be replaceable by machines, and thank God for that. But again, we are talking 100 timepieces per year, and when a brand produces tens of thousands of watches per year, you clearly understand that this is simply impossible to achieve with higher production volumes. And that's also fine, as long as no one tries to make you believe that everything is done by hand, if you see what I mean. It was then time to move up the stairs and visit the assembly atelier, and many of our guys were quite surprised by the youth of the watchmakers, but there is also an explanation for this. I expected to see, you know, old guys with white beards and, you know, glasses this thick. And when I came and I found out that all the people here are jeune and young and excited and under 25 years old, I was shocked. And then I realized that they have the best of the best, they achieve the best of the best, but they have a vision forward. They, they, they have the culture, they want it to remain forever, but they want it to start from scratch. He said, I want people who do not have any background to come work with me because I don't want, them, I don't want their minds to be polluted by other brands' uh, ways. And uh, I respect that totally. It's beautiful. It's incredible. What stood out to me the most was simply just how kind everyone here is, how truly invested they are. They use really high technology to make very traditional watchmaking, and I, I really appreciate that. They do it out of love and out of passion, and you know, they're, they're humans who really enjoy what they're doing, and they want to share it with the world as best as they can. And that's really, I think, what stands out for me the most. I think the layout especially um, contributes to that because everything's so united, everything works very closely together. People are just happy here. I mean, even the sheep on the roof seem to be happy being here, so uh, it's a good place. So to see that many incredible timepieces being assembled was quite something, but our surprise did not stop there, as we were now about to get really close and personal with some of these watches, and what better guy than Mr. Forsey himself to talk us through some of their spectacular models, a nice and privileged moment. I don't think there ever existed a tray in the world with 11 timepieces from uh, Gribble Forsey on it. You can change how the light hits it, you have a loop, you have uh, you know, the man who made them sitting five feet away from you explaining to you what he thinks about it. Um, you know, answering all your questions patiently. Um, you, even when we were being rushed out to get lunch, he was still sitting there telling us about the watches. Uh, so I, I don't think that'll ever happen again, but I'm really happy I, I was there for it because it's, uh, it's, it was incredible. The level of enthusiasm and passion he has explaining how each one of those functions and his obsession for perfection came through when he was setting every timepiece to the correct time before putting it around the table. So I found that amusing, but as well as showcasing what kind of personality is behind uh, this perfection. The one thing that I have noticed today that has been different from anything else we've seen earlier this week is, is the actual pieces seem alive. They actually seem like they're really living, breathing things. There's so much activity going on within the cases, it, it's, it's just, it's just a stand. They're not even held back by their imagination. Um, and, and, and I think ultimately where will they be in another, in another 12 years is, is astounding. They don't necessarily paint the metal, they don't paint the material, they treat it to make it have a more natural colour, which I thought was really cool. Uh, but yeah, seeing the blue, I love, I love blue on watches, I think it's a great colour. And I thought the, the red triangles as well, the red details was really good. Um, but then again, how they sort of, they use materials in sort of like a really nice dark grey, sort of like a gunmetal grey, 
that was fantastic as well. And, and then something else that was really nice is there's a real sort of depth to it, three-dimensional, something that really stood out to me is when they had the GMT piece and you've got that globe and you sort of turn it on its side and you can see there's the little sapphire ring that marks the equator. Yeah, it's the tiny little details like that that you give it that extra depth and it yeah, looks absolutely incredible. I told you, fireworks for the guys and the grand finale was even more exciting for all of us as we got to choose which one we wanted to wear and we all gently found ourselves in some kind of twilight zone, a comfortable and dreamy one I must say. Everything they've realized has not been done before. It's all been innovative, it's all been brand new. This takes quite a lot of balls, you know, to do. <laughs> and I really, really respect that and appreciate it, you know. They're adding a lot to the uh, watch industry and uh, they're needed. They're needed. We need people like uh, Grubel and Forsy to, to take a step forward, a leap forward in watchmaking. And they have done it very well. So with smiles up to our ears, it was now time to move on, but again, our little 1967 bus showed us his real age, and we got stuck for a while on the barking of Grubel Force. We tried everything. Daniel was calling some member of his family back in Colombia, who were used to these Volkswagen machines, but no miracle, we had to wait for a repair service to come and help us. But this was also part of the adventure. So before closing this Grubel Force chapter, I just wanted to mention that something really remarkable with this company is their willingness to share what quality watchmaking is all about. And we've seen this, for example, with the Naissance du Monde project, done in collaboration with no one else than Mr. Philippe Dufour. So this episode unfortunately concludes our watchmaking road trip journey, but we still have one final episode where I will make a wrap up of this fabulous adventure with our guys. What did they all bring back home and has their vision on watchmaking evolved after having lived from the inside what watchmaking is all about? Our ultimate mission, sharing with all of you our love and passion for this fabulous craft. So see you soon and thanks to all for watching and sharing this cool adventure. All the best. Action! Hey.